Luke, I can't see my question bar on the left on the left uh, iPad if someone can. Welcome to the Conference Board special webcast, Urgent and Timely Issues. And I can't think of a more urgent and timely issue than this topic today. Uh, today's webcast is entitled, How Nielsen Tracked High, Tackled High Musculoskeletal Claims and Workforce Chronic Pain. My name is Phil Mikali, Principal of VUL International, which is a specialized uh, consulting firm, benefits consulting firm, working with providers and payers, helping them close gaps of care, moving from politics to policy to program to performance. And I've uh, been working with the conference board for over 15 years. Uh, and here, actually, as a, in terms of con contribution for seminars, and webcasts, and whatnot like this, and conferences, uh, Greg Morrow asked me to fill in for him today. So that's why I'm here. Thank you for joining. Uh, all 200 plus of you, thank you. Um, before we hear of today's present, about today's presenters and get into our program for the next hour, let's go over a few housekeeping items. Um, so, this is a, uh, available for CPE credits and SHRM and HCRI, as you can see on the screen. Uh, so, stay online for the entire webcast in order to, to accomplish that and to achieve those. And credit is available for participation uh, in the live webcast only, not in the on-demand, which will be available after this session. Okay, today's presenters. Uh, we have um, our first presenter will be Dr. Jeff Krauss, Chief Medical Officer at Hinge Health, uh, and Victoria Pavlov, Global Benefits Director for Nielsen, a large employer with almost 45,000 employees based in headquarters in New Jersey. And based in Charlotte, North Carolina, we have uh, Zach Seavey, uh, who is the Director of Health uh, and Benefits. Uh, so I would like to, also I'd like to encourage you that the Q, there's Q&A session uh, that we've reserved time for. Please submit your questions in the digital box um, in uh, the webcast screen and we will do our best to get through all the questions. Uh, to the extent that we don't, we will follow up with responses uh, from there uh, offline. And we really think this will make a more meaningful uh, webcast. Uh, if you do ask questions, it'll be more meaningful for everyone. Okay, so as far as some of the critical questions that we're going to uh, address today, we will be answering is why are employers' uh, musculoskeletal claims so high? Uh, the solutions across the MSK continuum of care. MSK is short for, obviously, acronyms abound in healthcare uh, for musculoskeletal. Uh, and what is the MSK spend? And, and is it driven, how is it driven by avoidable back and uh, joint injuries? The last area that we'll address uh, is Nielsen's evidence-based approach to reduce the high MSK claims. And we'll have an interactive section, session with uh, Victoria and uh, Zach towards the end of this session today. So, on the question, Dr. Krauss, uh, who is, by the way, uh, a very um, uh, chief medical officer and, and very much into the innovative side of the equation here, based in San Francisco, uh, where Hinge Health was founded. Uh, he completed his residency in physical medicine and rehabilitation at Stanford, where we know a lot of innovation happens in healthcare anyway. So we're really pleased to have you present. Um, but I think the first question we want to ask you, maybe that your presentation will help answer, why are employer MSK claims so high? Dr. Krauss? Thanks, Phil. Um, well, yeah, let's dive into that question. So the, the way that I'd like to start off by answering that is actually to uh, tell a story that illustrates some of the common themes that we see in musculoskeletal work. So 
Um, here you can meet Robert. Uh, Robert is a 58-year-old data architect. He's a Nielsen employee uh, who recently went through our program in 2019. And uh, as you can see by his quote here, when, when he came to us, even the most simple tasks were particularly difficult for him. Um, he was considering having knee surgery. Uh, he was having a lot of pain. And there were a few common themes that, uh, that apply to Robert that we see over and over. So the first is there was constant pain in his life. There wasn't a day that passed where he wasn't having pain in his, in his knee and that it didn't affect his life in some way. The, the second thing is that the status quo just wasn't working for him. So he was doing physical therapy, he was going to doctor's visits, I think pain medication, but, but not really getting any better. Uh, and, and the last thing is that surgery just seemed inevitable for him. He didn't really see any other way out. Uh, when he had that pain, he felt like surgery was the solution, uh, and, and there, he didn't see any other way to get rid of so Robert is not alone. Uh, this is a very common uh, problem that, uh, that you'll see in your population. Uh, in a typical year, uh, over half of employees are going to be affected with some sort of uh, musculoskeletal disorder. And the big culprits are the ones that you can see here on the right side. So especially low back and knee pain, but that's closely followed by neck pain as well, and then, and then shoulder and hip pain. And importantly, these are expensive conditions. So once these become chronic, we're, the cost is somewhere in the range of about eight to $12,000 a year for taking care of one of these patients. And if it gets to the end stage, meaning uh, that it's getting to surgery, then we're looking at a cost in the range of fifty dollars to $100,000 um, covering surgery, the, the rehab, um, and all of the other associated costs there. So. The other thing to point out here is that these aren't just one-off costs. So oftentimes somebody might have a surgery and the biggest predictor of, of having a surgery is actually having a prior surgery. So just because someone gets a surgery doesn't mean that the, uh, that the problem is necessarily fixed. analytics, uh, looking at 10 million uh, employer uh, members, and what they found is that musculoskeletal disorders were the number one cost driver. Uh, as you can see here, they account for one out of approximately six healthcare dollars, uh, and in bigger than cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular claims. So a, a really large problem. We see this over and over when we do deployments. Um, that musculoskeletal costs are typically the number one cost, otherwise certainly within the top few. Now, the question is why are these costs so high? And when we've looked at claims data to understand this better, uh, what you can see here is that really it's, it's surgeries driving these costs. Um, their drugs are, are also a significant factor, but these surgeries are so expensive that they, they significantly drive up the total cost of care. Um, the, the thing that we'll get to is that many of these surgeries are avoidable, so there is hope. So at this point, I want to turn our attention a little bit to different places in the MSK continuum of care to talk about where is the best place that you can spend, uh, spend money in order to improve ROI. So, I want to do a poll here to get a sense of everybody's opinions. And uh, what the poll is going to ask is, what's the population that you feel would be best for you to focus on to drive down your musculoskeletal spend? So would that be in the preventative space, uh, acute uh, MSK care, chronic, or in surgery? We'll give, we'll give this about 30 seconds. So this is Phil speaking. I, if you can just... Uh Respond. This is not a trick question. Uh, we're going to get some valuable insights here um, that uh, Dr. Krauss is looking for to express some of his other points. Uh, but go ahead and respond. And we'll just break down to five, four, three, two, one to show the results.
Yes, and those um, results are very interesting. 59 of you, 30% uh, of you, 39 of you say that uh, preventative is uh, the area you should really focus. Uh, acute, 13%, a little more than 13%. Chronic, again, more, a little more than 13%. And surgery, again, 13 So interesting to see uh, how this came out, uh, Dr. Krauss. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, this is really interesting. So I, I have my work cut out. <laughs> I would say uh, so. <laughs> for me in the next in the coming slides, because uh, in in our analysis, um, we've reached some different conclusions, and so uh, I would love to walk you through our thinking. Um, but uh, it's really fascinating to see that preventative is is what most people think is the best way to drive down the costs. So let's let's get into it. Um, if we can go back to the slides. Rates. So let's go back to Robert's journey uh, in order to sort of understand better what we're talking about at each point in this process. So if we take uh, Robert's case, he was uh, overweight uh, for many years, uh, not particularly active, um, and uh, pretty much sedentary in a desk job for most of his career. And so he was at risk uh, for injuries. He was not in very good shape. And then one day, uh, he was lifting some heavy boxes. Uh, he immediately felt a twinge of pain in his knee and uh, very quickly realized that, that something had happened and something was wrong. But like with most people, after an acute injury, uh, after a few weeks of rest uh, and uh, taking care of it, uh, the injury resolved, the pain got better. So it was okay for a while, but then like many people, uh, that knee pain came back, um, and sitting at his desk all day certainly didn't help uh, the pain. And then he started to stay off of his knees, uh, which meant he wasn't doing very much movement. Uh, and then it started to impact his life. He wasn't going out as much. He wasn't socializing. So at that point, after uh, living with that for a while, uh, he was in his late 50s and got to the point where he felt like a $35,000 knee surgery was pretty much the only way out of the situation. And this is a really common MSK journey that, that probably many of your employees have faced. So let's walk through each of these phases in a little bit more detail and see what Robert could do at each step of the way. So for those years, uh, where Robert was at risk, where he was uh, obese, uh, he was not doing much activity. Uh, there are things that, that could have been offered to him. So lifestyle coaching, uh, helping him to manage his weight, giving him education on the importance of, uh, of movement and staying physically uh, fit and healthy. And then some ergonomics training might also have Helped, although, as we discussed, uh, you know, he, he injured it doing something that was just lifting a box. It's not always preventable. So then if we go to the next stage, uh, he had his acute injury. He was uh, doing something around the house like so many of us do. He tried to lift something, and there was an injury. Um, after that, he followed the standard protocol, the RICE protocol. So he's going to rest, ice it, put compression, elevation, and that's... That's what uh, the standard treatment would be for something that, that uh, is a, a kind of common everyday injury. He can take uh, medications, um, either prescription or over the counter. And then in some cases, somebody would do uh, physical therapy to help them recover if it's a more severe injury. So then we move into the chronic phase. So in the chronic phase, uh, there is uh, physical therapy or exercise therapy. When somebody has had pain for many years, that is uh, oftentimes very helpful. Uh, behavioral health interventions. This uh, helps people to uh, get motivated to do the work that they need to do. It also helps them to uh, think about their pain differently. Um, there's a lot of education about misconceptions that uh, is, can be given here. And then, uh, of course, medications as needed or procedures as needed to manage pain. Finally, we get into the last stage of the journey, and hopefully people don't get here. Um, but if you're getting to the point where surgery is uh, a major consideration, then there's a few things that could be done. So uh, there are second opinion services to make sure that surgery actually seems warranted. 
Uh, there are centers of excellence that are centers that are focused on surgery and, and we can try and send members to those uh, centers. Um, there are bundled payments that try and reduce the cost of care. Um, so at that stage as well, there are some things that, that can be done to help somebody like Robert. So then the question is, which population should I focus on uh, in order to reduce the cost uh, for my employees? And so I will uh, start now to try and uh, convince you that actually, like most, most people felt that the at-risk space was the, the place to start with, but my impression actually is that after looking at this for a while, the ROI in doing this actually is, is years away, and there are many, it's very difficult to reach people who are in this space. So if you uh, talk to Robert during those many years where he was uh, overweight and not doing physical activity, he probably knew that he wasn't uh, living a particularly healthy lifestyle. Um, but it's very difficult to engage people like that uh, because generally they feel fine. Um, the other issue is that this is a very large population of people who are just simply at risk. And so focusing, uh, this takes a lot of resources in order to uh, get this very large population to actually start doing things to improve their overall health. So it, for those reasons, um, addressing Robert uh, early on, I think, is, is a pretty difficult uh, task uh, in order to avoid his musculoskeletal pain and costs down the road. So then let's move on to the acute phase. So Robert had his injury, um, and he did what most people do, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Um, with or without any kind of care, the vast majority of acute injuries, uh, probably nine out of 10, are going to get better anyways in the range of six weeks or something. There is oftentimes not much that we can do to really speed up that acute healing process. And so from an ROI perspective, interventions can even have a negative ROI. There's not that much that we can do to improve the, the natural healing process. So I'm gonna skip over chronic for a minute uh, and just go into the, the surgery post-op uh, situation. So the first thing to realize if you're putting money into surgery post-operative care is that these surgeries are certainly not guaranteed to work. So there are very high failure recurrence rates when we're looking at back pain. It's somewhere in the range of 20 to 40%. You can figure a third of the surgeries are, are not gonna work. Um, sometimes they may get worse. Um, the other thing here is that some people will try and uh, steer patients to, uh, to a center of excellence. Uh, but there's evidence now that these centers of excellence, uh, at least in the back pain world, don't really provide uh, any real cost savings over uh, other centers. Um, some other things here is that it's often by the time that you get to this point of being ready for surgery or post-operative care, someone has seen an orthopedic surgeon or a neurosurgeon, and it's really too late to avoid the surgery. Um, that, that cost is essentially going to happen. So the place where we feel that it is uh, most beneficial to focus uh, resources on for the best ROI is actually in the chronic care space. So what we found is that uh, the most frequent users of healthcare are the people with chronic conditions. This is outside of MSK, but you see you know, it's 90% of all prescriptions come from people with chronic conditions, over 80% of hospital admissions, uh, about three quarters of physician visits. So this, the people who have chronic conditions are oftentimes the most expensive ones. Um, the other thing to keep in mind here is that this population is intrinsically motivated. So when somebody has pain, they want to do something to get rid of it. Um, when you're looking at the at-risk population and there's no pain, it's very hard to do anything about. Um, I, I sometimes think about my colleagues in primary care trying to address hypertension or um, where, where somebody feels good, um, but their numbers are high. It's just very hard to motivate someone. What we've experienced is that people really want to get better. Their chronic pain is severely impacting their life. Um, uh, and then uh, the other 
area to point out here is that uh, addressing this chronic pain can have a lot of other uh, benefits outside of ROI and costs alone. So there is the issue of productivity and absenteeism. A lot of people are missing work or not being as productive at work if they have chronic pain. And then there's, of course, the opioid issues. People uh, might start taking opioids and we're all familiar with the challenges that that presents. So to summarize here, we believe that, that addressing chronic MSK actually has the greatest impact on outcomes. We talked about negative or break even ROI for some of the other interventions at different phases, um, but that uh, when you're dealing with a chronic population, you have an intrinsically motivated population and lots of benefits in addition to avoiding costly surgeries, also improve productivity, also avoid opioids, and uh, I didn't even mention it, but there's also a lot of mental health benefits that we've experienced as well in our population. Okay, so I wanna get now into uh, why patients actually um, choose to do uh, back and joint surgeries and how they're avoidable in many cases. So when we go back to Robert's situation, uh, Robert had a lot of misconceptions about surgery as being the best solution for his condition. So first of all, he saw an MRI that showed a defect and he felt like, of course, that needed to be fixed. Second, he thought if he got surgery, that would quickly end the problem and then he could move on with his life. And he felt like surgery was going to be the best long-term solution. So let me take each of these one by one and try to address them. So the first thing is, the first most common myth is that surgery is required for an imaging abnormality. So if we look at an MRI, here is a, an MRI of a knee um, with a torn meniscus on the medial side. And a lot of people would see this and say, oh, well, of course, there's a tear, it requires surgery. The big thing to take away, though, is that the, there are extremely high rates of finding an imaging abnormality uh, on an MRI in people who have no pain at all. So uh, people with meniscal tears, about 60% don't have any pain or stiffness. So if Robert has a meniscus tear, it's really not clear that it's actually the cause of his pain, and going in to treat it surgically might not improve his pain at all. Um, another stat here is that of people over 50 with no pain, about 90% are gonna have some type of MR, MRI abnormality. And you can see this in knees. We see it all the time in people who come uh, to my clinic for back pain. There's always some sort of abnormality that you find on an MRI. And it really does not mean that that's the cause of the pain or that surgery is indicated to take care of it. So then let's move on to the second myth. So that, that is that surgery is going to be a quick fix to somebody's pain. And here what we find is first, there is actually quite a long road to recovery after surgery. So uh, you have to figure there's about uh, about a 12 week period before somebody returns to work. And it's oftentimes a three to six month period of swelling and pain that somebody is going to be living with after a surgery. Um, the stat on the right is referring to knee and hip replacements. And about 30% of people with knee and hip replacements never actually return to work um, or they end up having reduced hours at work. So surgery is not a quick fix. The last in, uh, myth here is that surgery is going to have better outcomes. And that is clearly not true. So I am not saying that uh, surgery uh, is not necessary in some cases. For sure there are cases where surgery is absolutely indicated. However, when it comes to chronic conditions, uh, surgery really does not mean a better outcome. So this here is a New England Journal of Medicine um, surgery looking at people with chronic meniscus tears. Uh, they actually did a sham surgery. So they took some of the people to the operating room. They uh, had all of the noises and smells that are associated with the OR. Um, and then they looked at recovery rates over time. And as you can see here, there was absolutely no difference between the real surgery and the sham surgery in terms of results. And, and this isn't the only situation where sham uh, procedures have been shown to be equivalent to surgeries. In many cases, it may be that the surgery itself is really uh, inducing a placebo effect that is making somebody feel better afterwards. 
So you might then be asking, um, what should we do? So if surgery is not the right answer, what do you do when somebody has it? And here, there are some very clear answers with near universal uh, recommendations by the leading medical bodies. So there are really three pillars of successful non-surgical intervention. So the obvious one people might think of as physical therapy. Here, that's uh, exercise therapy, so getting people moving. If there was a silver bullet, that would probably be it. But that's not enough uh, alone. So it has to be coupled with education. People have to understand that there are a lot of misconceptions out there. For example, uh, people will often feel like they're not supposed to move when they have chronic pain, that they should be resting. Um, and that is definitely not what they should be doing. And then behavioral health interventions are critical here. People know they're supposed to do physical therapy and they're supposed to do their exercises. Uh, they're supposed to have healthy behaviors, but obviously a lot of us just don't do it. And so having behavioral health support helps to keep people motivated and accountable and also helps them to think differently about, uh, the, about how they think about pain that they're dealing with and uh, to start to get rid of issues that, they, that so many people with chronic pain uh, have, such as catastrophization or exaggerating and feeling like symptoms are just never going to get better. When these three are all combined together, the evidence is really on our side, though, and we see remarkable improvements. Okay. So, Bill, I turn it back over Thank to you. Thank you, Dr. Krauss. Very enlightening. I would like to open up for some questions. Um, uh, and also, there has been a question about downloading the slides. In the housekeeping piece, I failed to mention before that there are case studies available, but not this uh, slide deck itself. Uh, either on demand or otherwise uh, in terms of download today, but there are some really valuable case studies that transcend beyond the Nielsen example uh, about this solution, about this intervention, about this innovation. So please click on that in the uh, download pod. Um, so here's one question, Dr. Kraus. How do you differentiate between MSK conditions that should be surgically fixed? Yeah. Um... So in our program, we have a, we start with a screener, um, and there are certain conditions um, that, that definitely need to be seen by a clinician and oftentimes will require surgery. So fracture would be an obvious example of that. Um, there are some cases where there's cancer, infections, um, and then when you're dealing with back or back pain or knee pain, there are um, issues associated with uh, neurological compromise. Um, that are, have some really severe symptoms, uh, focal weakness, uh, bowel bladder incontinence, loss of sensation. When you see those kinds of things, those really have to be evaluated by a surgeon, um, and, and they very well might require a surgery. The vast majority of, of everything else, though, falls into the standard uh, realm of something where conservative care is at least worth a shot. Uh, and it, it oftentimes will work, uh, especially if people are uh, engaged with their pairs, which is something that Hinge really focuses on, is keeping people engaged. Um, but even if it didn't work, there is very rarely any harm in trying conservative care before trying a more procedural approach. Okay, very helpful. Thank you. Another question is, how do employers, employers prevent these types of injuries from happening <clears throat> in the first place? So going back to that, you know, because you really described a population health management approach that let's target the population where you're going to have the biggest bang for your buck and you're going to see the value of what you're spending in, in terms of an approach. But in terms of preventative, we don't necessarily want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think the question is, how can we prevent these injuries from happening in the first place? Yeah, I think we all would like to do that. Um, and I think that is the best approach if it's possible to do. Um, and I, I do believe that, uh, especially in certain types of positions where they're doing heavy uh, lifting or they have repetitive loads, or maybe where there's performance is particularly important, uh, that, that there is some ergonomic training or biomechanics training that can be helpful. Um, that being said, uh, the vast majority of these conditions are, are stemming either from an injury that may have happened a long time ago, 
Um, they're developing um, in ways that we can't necessarily prevent. I mean, you can't prevent acute MSK injuries um, altogether, and oftentimes those are going to end up becoming chronic. Um, so I, I think it's a worthwhile endeavor to give people the information that might help. But in practice, as we've discussed, uh, you can't prevent a lot of the pain, um, and uh, and then a lot of people just won't follow the guidelines. Um, the more people will stay healthy. Uh, one of my passions is an area called lifestyle medicine, uh, focuses on um, really just generally healthy living. And the more that you can get people to be healthy, uh, it's absolutely uh, fantastic. It's just extremely difficult to do for the larger population. Okay, thank you. Uh, one other question is, does exercise therapy involve solely working with physical therapists? Or are there other exercise therapy methodologies that you would condone in this context? So it definitely does not just involve working with physical therapists. Uh, there is sort of a broad range of exercise that I would consider therapeutic exercise. Um, in the HINGE program, for example, uh, we do a series of light stretching and strengthening exercises, which are similar to the exercises that a physical therapist might use, but but there's no need to actually see a physical therapist in the vast majority of cases. Uh, in our case, to make sure people do the exercises correctly, we just use some uh, simple sensors that go above and below the joint and can monitor range of motion, and we can give guidance um, through a tablet to uh, make sure that uh, people are doing the exercises more or less correctly. I'd say in the vast majority of cases, actually seeing a physical therapist um, is not necessary. There certainly is a role for physical therapy in person, uh, but for the typical chronic conditions, it definitely does not have to go to a physical therapist. Okay, there are a couple other questions, um, and we're gonna, I think I'm going to save those for the uh, employer case study with Victoria and Zach speaking. But one I want to ask you that I had prepared is, how, can we uh, do these interventions without someone seeing a clinician in person? As we have now patients who are daring to participate more in their own health outcomes, um, is there a way to do this without a clinician in person? Is this a truly a digi digital health approach? Yeah, so that goes back to our, our screener. So, you know, if somebody comes into our program, there are certain questions that a clinician is going to ask. Um, I would ask the same questions if I saw someone in clinic, and the responses to those questions really guide the care. So, in our case, the screener is really critical to make sure that we're not dealing with someone who needs to see a clinician. But it's something that we can uh, we can identify online about who is who has symptoms that really warrant uh, in-person care and who could be treated completely digitally. Uh, when we're talking about uh, chronic pain, that's you know three months or more. Uh, in the vast majority of cases, it doesn't actually require going in to see a clinician. Again, the the point is. Uh someone daring to participate in their own health, which is going to take perhaps more time and longer duration, but have better outcomes than what people may think about it uh, as consumers and patients and families who support them as a quick fix, uh, I think was what I was hearing from your presentation. Uh, so we're going to move on now to the employer case study uh, and save the other questions for later. Uh, but I, just, I do want to uh, reintroduce you to Victoria Pavlov, Director of uh, Global Benefits for Nielsen, large employer, and you'll hear more about the scope of their uh, footprint throughout the nation and not throughout the world. Uh, and Victoria was previously at American Express, which also has a very innovative and very ex uh, a program that experiments a lot with various innovations uh, in its benefit program here based out of New York. Uh, we also have Zachary Seavey. Uh, he's director of, I said before, of health and benefits for Willis. He's a strategic partner and a trusted advisor to large complex clients. Uh, that's hopefully not viewed as pejorative, uh, uh, like Nielsen, uh, to you, Victoria, but he supports the design and management of their health and benefits plans. And he has a particular personal focus on integrated well-being and digital health, which we're talking about today. So I'm going to leave it to you now to uh, continue on with the presentation. And then please submit your questions, uh, even while they're speaking. Uh, I'm glad to pose them uh, on behalf of everybody uh, after they're done with the presentation. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Phil. I will share a little bit uh, more information about who Nielsen is uh, before we uh, learn more about our partnership with Hinge Health. So Nielsen is a global measurement and data analytics company. 
Um, what we do is our data um, monitors and uh, measures what people watch, what they read, um, what they buy and where they buy it. This data serves our clients to um, estimate their sales and market share and uh, determine their future strategies to increase uh, those sales and market share. Nielsen has over uh, 45,000 employees in 106 countries. In the U.S., we have approximately 10,000 employees, um, a little over 15,000 members uh, in our plans. Our population tends to be uh, on the younger side, uh, think of average membership age in uh, low 30s. They are tech savvy, um, they have access to a computer on a daily basis, and um, they are dispersed uh, everywhere uh, in the U.S. So uh, this is the uh, kind of the background as to the population we're trying to reach. In terms of our benefit strategy, um, we strive to improve the well-being of our employees uh, by offering them programs uh, that, that do have inherent value in them, uh, while at the same time uh, controlling costs both for the member and uh, for Nielsen. What uh, we've done uh, over the past several years is offer customized programs, including programs targeted to specific segments of our population. Um, we uh, strive to be very innovative and we've uh, gone down the path of doing short cycle pilots, which then um, after measuring after a certain uh, time period, if we find them successful, then uh, the program is offered to the broader uh, population at Nielsen uh, in the U.S. Zach and his team at uh, Willis Towers Watson have been our partner in evaluating solutions like this um, and for those uh, pilots and measuring um, success and also uh, helping us figure out what we want to measure. Um, so they've been an integral part of our um, evolution and, and progress uh, as a company. And uh, that's why Zach is here today uh, to speak with me about uh, the results we're seeing uh, with Hinge Health. Can I just interject a second, Victoria, and ask on the consumer-driven side, how long has that been in place? Uh, potentially a high deductible plan with a health savings account or something like that, just indicative of how you can do follow-through innovations on the clinical side. Um, so we, we have um, high deductible health plans um, with a health savings account, and that has been in place for over eight okay. years. Um, I want to be a little off on the years, but, but something close okay, to Okay, just want to just point that out because it may set the stage for higher engagement levels when you introduce a program like Hinge in the last couple of years, possibly. Yeah, and it is, the, the high deductible plan is not our only okay. option. Uh, so um, th there are deductibles, of course, uh, in place where we're far from the copay days. Um, but we'll see how uh, I, I believe engagement here is driven by um, other okay. factors. Thank you. So on, on this slide here, um, what is the challenge in musculoskeletal care? Uh, of course, we uh, were seeing musculoskeletal conditions uh, as a challenge because they rank very high uh, on our uh, cost list. Uh, musculoskeletal conditions in terms of cost were number two for us, and um, they impact one in five of our members. And uh, our population, uh, there are people who sit at desks, who work in offices, whether at home or in, in a kind of more formal office, uh, but there are also people in the field, and uh, we've seen uh, them experience musculoskeletal uh, issues um, regardless of what their um, work area is. Victoria, Zach, I'm just going to chime in here. I think, you know, in this case, your experience is not all that unique in terms of musculoskeletal. Um, across industries, we see it always as a top 10. Most clients have it as a top five cost driver. I think I've seen it as high as half of the members in the population are impacted in any given year by it. Um, so it really is something that's on the radar of most of the employers that we're working with. 
Um, the other thing I'd point out, especially depending on the industry that you're in, is there can be a lot of impact in terms of workers' comp and disability and leave. And so to have a complete picture of what's happening with the MSK spend, it's really important to take a, take a broad view of it. Uh, Victoria, can you tell us a little bit more about what you were looking for in a solution? I know Nielsen's been focused on this for a number of years and has tried things like expert opinions as a solution. Uh, tell us a little bit more about you know, the evolution there and what you were hoping to accomplish with the solution. Thank you, uh, Zach. Yes, yeah, so um, I, I really like the picture on this slide and I wish there was such a clear path, <laughs> but unfortunately it wasn't. Um, <laughs> So what happened was it, it was uh, all the way back in 2016 when we saw uh, Hinge Health at, a, at an innovation forum and uh, really liked the idea, the digital aspect of it, um, the fact that uh, you could engage the member um, to do the physical therapy in a setting that they find comfortable, that they're not tied to a specific location. Um, we were looking for a really something that would dis disrupt the status quo um, because, as you mentioned, Zach, we've had a second opinion solution uh, in place for many years. And you just, even for the people who use that second opinion service, you don't know if they realize um, if they have chronic pain that they have other options, they don't need to run to surgery. Um, so uh, this is kind of where our thinking started uh, when we saw Hinge Health um, in late 2016. Yeah, and Victoria, I'll just get a chime in on this one. I think the context is really important on this one. You know, as we sit here in 2020, there's a whole host of solutions we can choose from now for musculoskeletal pain. But back in 2016, when we started looking at this, uh, it was a much more limited field. And while ideally you'd like to have a solution that has a track record of success, you know, has employer references, uh, it was pretty early days in 2016. And so, you know, the concept of piloting made a lot of sense given where we were. And I think the things that we liked about this solution, um, obviously the evidence-based design of the solution, we liked the use of technology to drive engagement. You mentioned, you know, a tech-savvy workforce, and so that seemed to align really nicely. And then just the partnership approach to evaluation and determining uh, if it was successful. Victoria, can you comment a little bit more on some of the outcomes you were hoping to achieve as part of this program? Yes, absolutely. Um, number one for us was uh, getting people engaged. And um, we, we thought if we could just get them to um, participate in this, uh, we would see other benefits from their participation. Um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, surgery, and that not being the path that they need to go down on. Um, so surgery avoidance uh, was definitely high on the list. We were hoping um, if engagement and uh, surgery avoidance uh, really happened, that we would also see uh, some really, um, you know, hard dollar uh, return on investment. Yeah, I think two points are really critical as we were thinking about this. Um, the first one was we spent a lot of time on the front end making sure we were all aligned in terms of what the outcomes are. So we had a really clear picture at the outset in terms of how we were going to define success, and we're all on the same page there. Uh, the other one, and Victoria is going to go through some of the outcomes here in just a minute. Uh, you'll see a kind of a snapshot of what we looked at, but we were able to uh, look at outcomes across the whole value chain. And what I mean by that is we were able to say, you know, is this a program that people are interested in? Uh, will they sign up and engage? Uh, do they engage in a meaningful way over time such that we can expect them to have uh, improvement in their health? And then ultimately, are they reporting improvement in health and is it flowing through to some of the clients? Uh, Victoria, I'll let you walk through more of the solution, how it works, and some of the outcomes that we're able to achieve. So, um, as I mentioned, we uh, first uh, we discovered uh, Hinge Health towards uh, late 2016. We uh, launched a pilot in uh, the latter part of 2017, and uh, that was um, very successful. And, and then we ended up rolling the program out um, to our entire population in 2018. And um, Dr. Kraus spoke earlier about uh, the three pillars of best care practice. Uh, we will go over these in terms of results and what Nielsen has seen a little bit later. Uh, but now I'd like to uh, share with you 
um, a, a short video on uh, what the program actually looks like when, when someone is uh, doing those exercises. So to the team in the studio, if you don't mind launching the... Here's Steve. He's taking part in the Hinge Health program for back pain and is using his motion sensors to guide him through some therapeutic exercises. In his first exercise, the app guides Steve into a side bed. He moves his body into the green target zone and holds the position for the suggested amount of time. The wearable sensors guide members with real-time feedback so they're confident at each step, while the app tracks if members have been doing their exercises to help keep them accountable. Steve's next exercise is a woodpecker stretch. As he completes the exercises, both he and his health coach can see his progress over time. Each session consists of therapeutic exercises and education to read, and it takes only 10 to 15 minutes. Over time, he'll unlock new exercises to continue to build his mobility and strength as he receives support from his health coach to achieve his goals. By committing to the program and reading his weekly educational articles, Steve has a better perception of how to manage his condition and sees a significant reduction in his pain so he can do the things he loves. I hope, um, thank you. I hope the, um, the video gave you some idea about um, how the exercises are actually done. And the question was, so is the program really working? Are people participating? Um, we saw uh, over the past two years, over 900 participants in, with the Hinge Health Program. And uh, I will go over with you uh, in, in terms of specific outcomes around engagement and uh, clinical outcomes, uh, what, we've seen, what we've seen. Exercise therapy sessions. Um, anyone who has uh, had to go to physical therapy knows 90% of the work is actually getting it to that, getting to that physical therapy office. And once you're there, you do the exercises, but um, you know, how, how do you make it there, make time out of your work schedule, out of family obligations? Over 12 weeks, uh, we saw our participants uh, have, uh, on average, 29 uh, sessions, which uh, averages about two to three exercise sessions per week, uh, which to me is phenomenal in terms of participation, um, just making sure that they continue to participate week after week, um, and you will see shortly in the clinical outcomes, I, I do believe this is tied directly to uh, what they're feeling as personal impact, uh, how their pain uh, is improving. In terms of um, the program also has one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching and behavioral support. We saw very high engagement there as well, um, almost four times per week. Um, this uh, helped our participants stay engaged. And uh, there's also from an engagement perspective, uh, the educational component. Um, so what we saw is over, again, the, the course of the program of 12 weeks um, that uh, members read over 17 articles. Um, the articles are, uh, served at uh, different times of their, of their treatment, and they are uh, personalized to where the person is in their uh, journey to improving uh, their health. Um, they are uh, very well-written and um, easy to understand, but they're not super short. And uh, what I find very interesting here is that people continue to engage over and over and really read those articles um, that would truly educate them. Uh, for example, this is not your only, uh, surgery is not your only option. And by the time they're seeing um, improvement in their pain, um, the messages that they're, gain, that they're getting and the education uh, start to resonate uh, more with them. Zach, anything here? No, I mean, I think I'm always impressed by the education, uh, the engagement levels that we see with this. We spend a lot of time thinking through incentive designs for employers and how do we get people to take action. And it's easy to look at some of these numbers and kind of miss how much actual activity is happening here. But 
you know, two to three times a week engaging in an exercise session is phenomenal. Um, and we're not we're not piling tons of money behind this to get people to engage. So it really seems to to suggest that we're doing something that's meaningful and impactful to people that they continue to so engage. So that means, Zach, this is um, uh, just in terms of the financial incentives. There's not a lot of design to uh, to have a differentiated benefit design where people, you know, get a a contribution to their health savings account or some kind of gift card in order to engage. This is more focused on, again, the people that are chronic and that they have a true need and it's intrinsic. Yeah, that's, that's right. I mean, there's some points associated with it in the incentive design for this year, but I think it's, you know, maybe the equivalent of 10 or $12 mm. that you get for signing up. So it's not yeah. huge dollar amounts that we're getting. It's more just to create some attention towards it and get people to take Another question we had, uh, Victoria and Zach, uh, is what makes up the behavioral health component? Who leads this pillar of intervention, and how is that part implemented? So um, I would, would like to park this question for a little bit later because I think Dr. Krause needs to weigh in in terms of um, the behavioral uh, support that's provided by the coach. Um, but it really uh, is used in this context as the support to, to the member um, as, as they go through okay. the program. Thank you. So in terms of the intrinsic motivation to um, participate in the program, as, uh, as Zach just pointed out, we were not paying members to participate uh, there are a couple of points that they could earn uh, in our well-being program, uh, but it wasn't something that would really drive them to, to do that if that was their only reason. And um, what we're seeing here is, to me, very, very telling. Um, it, it's the, the change in the pain level that the members are reporting at the time of screening and as they go through the program. And as you can see, there's a, a huge decrease in the pain levels, uh, even in the first four weeks um, as they get into the program. Um, uh, that's about you know 62% reduction in the pain overall. Um, as you can see, a very sharp decline the first four weeks, and it continues to decline um, through the end of the program. Um, this is actually better uh, pain reduction than if people were on opioids. Um, and we'll see in a couple of slides uh, how this impacts other um, areas of, of a person's life. From an ROI perspective, uh, I just want to uh, explain what you're seeing here um, a little bit. So the, uh, the gray uh, bar is the level at the time of screening and the orange is at, at week 12 which is at the completion of the program and this is the reported um, likelihood of surgery as members reported it as you can see there is a huge reduction between uh, what happened at the time of screening and uh, when uh, folks have completed the program we had uh, one person uh, a 46 year old uh, data analyst, uh, she was in such severe uh, pain and chronic that she couldn't actually participate in any activities with her children. Um, so when she initially did the screening uh, at the beginning of the program, uh, she thought she would need uh, surgery with like 50% certainty, uh, like very soon. And then once she completed the program, she was able to move and was feeling much better and for her that probability completely dropped to the extent where she said i don't i'm not even considering surgery anymore um and, and those are kind of the the type of outcomes that we'd like to see and we're very happy to see the program work uh, that way for our members um, the pain reduction we saw on an earlier slide is uh, tied to uh, how members feel um, anxiety and depression being directly linked to um, to the chronic pain that people are experiencing, and uh, as what, as as pain is going down as people are going through uh, the program, um, as you can see here, the screening uh, levels are high for both anxiety and depression, and then they are uh, significantly reduced um, at at about halfway through the program. Uh, anxiety uh, is seeing a reduction by 60% and uh, depression by 42. 
So uh, great results. Uh, this is what members uh, are, are reporting uh, as seeing, um, as experiencing as, as they've been through the program. Pro from a productivity perspective, um, also seeing some uh, very positive results here, um, a drop in absenteeism um, as people are participating in the program, uh, which makes a lot of sense. You know, if someone is in chronic pain and, and finds it hard to concentrate, or if they need to go to a, a physical therapy uh, office and they need to step away from work, uh, all of this is contributing to um, kind of that absenteeism rate uh, reducing as, as the program um, is completed. Um, I'd like to share now um, a video of uh, one of our members and how they met the challenge of chronic pain. Uh, I had a problem with my medial collateral ligament, which is the inside of uh, your knee. In my case, it was on the right-hand side. And it's very, very tender. I could walk down the street and, and, I, and I'd feel the effects of the pain. Oh whole other side to any kind of injury is your mental capacity, your, your mental outlook. And I took medications and of course uh, I was heading down a path for seeing some professional medical help and that's the last thing I wanted to do. I did just recently completed the, the knee program and now... I always love hearing the user testimonials. I know, you know a lot of days our jobs can be really challenging, and I think sometimes we don't spend enough time hearing some of these stories and the impacts that we're having on our members. But uh, as you can see, it can be really impactful, some of the programs that we offer. Uh, we covered a lot of ground today. So in closing, did want to uh, leave you with a few points to think about as you're thinking about how this might apply to your population. Um, the first one being that there is a continuum uh, where you can intervene to impact MSK spend. And hopefully you have some new takeaways or insights that came out of Dr. Cross's section, and really chronic MSK pain being one of the areas that can be most impactful. The other is, as you're evaluating different solutions for your population, I'd encourage you to look at these different dimensions as you're evaluating them. So there's certainly no shortage of literature in terms of what the best practice care is for MSK, and I'd really encourage you to make sure any solutions that you're putting in line up with that evidence-based uh, recommendation. The second is proven outcomes, and while it's good to have an ROI guarantee, and a lot of vendors in the marketplace have this, it's really important that you look along that whole continuum from, you know, are you getting people in the front door, are they engaging with the program, are they engaging in a meaningful way, and then are they reporting outcomes that are actually uh, impacting plan spend in the long run. And finally, operational excellence. So ideally, any solution that you put in is going to have a track record of success, uh, successful deployments under their belt referenceable clients that you can call and ask about their program and how it works. And then most importantly, that the users of the program are raving fans like some of the testimonials that we So with that, Phil, I'll turn it back over to you and let you open it up for questions. Thank you. Well, this has been so engaging so far that we have uh, just a few minutes, a couple minutes left for questions before we close. Uh, one of them that's been presented is, have you seen a reduction in MSK surgeries post-intervention? Maybe Dr. Krauss, you can refer to that. Sure, yeah. Um, so we are uh, actively looking at claims right now, uh, but from our early customers, um, you, know, you need to wait a good uh, year or 15 months or so in order to be able to uh, really see a reduction. But uh, it looks encouraging right now when we're looking at the claims data from our early customers. And actually, we're doing an analysis right now and, and hoping that we'll be able to publish it. But uh, yeah, it, it does seem like we really are able to actually lower the costs and reduce surgeries. Okay, the one other last question I'll pose from the group is how were employees with screening for surgery identified on the ROI slide? Maybe Victoria or Dr. Krauss? Uh, could you just repeat that sure. question? Sure, how were employees with screening for surgery identified? when you referred to them on the ROI slide, uh, Victoria and Zach? Um, I, I can address that, and, and Jeff, please jump in um, as needed. So um, they are asked as part of their uh, screening and then throughout the program 
um, based uh, on their kind of opinion, how likely they are to, um, uh, to be in need of surgery. So everyone who is participating in the program is answering those questions. Dr. Krauss, is, is that true? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Um, it, just in terms of the actual uh, sort of mechanics of that, uh, yeah, everybody is asked that we, uh, when they start the program week one, week six, and then week 11 again, uh, what the likelihood is that they're going to have surgery in the next year, uh, and that's what that score is based on. Okay. And then we also asked it five years Perfect. Ago. Well, I think that's all the time we have for questions. I would like to close by thanking everyone for participating. Um, in the audience as well as the speakers and the producers obviously here at the conference board. This has been very, I think, informational and helpful and hopefully you can deploy some of these thoughts and ideas into your uh, contemplation of different program design. I do want to remind you that there is a program evaluation so please look on uh, the web page there that you're logged into to do a program evaluation. We'd like to use that feedback to improve in the future. Uh, on these webcasts and other conferences and such. Uh, also, I would encourage you that there is a program discount for the upcoming employee healthcare conference, which is it's in its 20th year now uh, in San Diego and New York, respectively, at the end of March, early April. And so that's a $500 discount. And if you use the code KN1 when you uh, purchase and register, uh, you will get a $500 uh, discount. So. Thank you again, and we really appreciate your participation.